Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Conversations from Stretch. I'm really glad to welcome you back. Again, my name is Dave Livingston, president of Lewis University. And I'm glad today to welcome with me uh, Dr. Christy Kelly, who's our chief diversity officer here at Lewis. Our other guests uh, this afternoon will be uh, Mike Zagadlow, who's our chief of police here at Lewis University, uh, and Dr. Jennifer Teo Bunton, Associate Professor of Sociology. And, and we'll invite them in uh, later as our conversation goes on. I wanna take a moment at the beginning here to talk a little bit um, uh, about my reactions to the events that have been happening in the country. I do wanna note as we start uh, the show today that though we've received some questions, very important questions about how the university is gonna respond to COVID and what's going on with classes, we are not going to address those today. We'll send emails to those people that sent them in, uh, and then next week we will get back to the issues um, around COVID and the reopening of campus. Today we're focusing uh, our conversation on the structural racism that exists in our country and the murder of George Floyd and all that that has risen, uh, raised up in our society in terms of all the many uh, black and brown lives that have been lost over the centuries. Uh, I wanted to begin my um, short opening by just acknowledging that each of us come to this from a very different perspective. And I want to acknowledge my own uh, social location as we talk about it as a white man of privilege. I am one of the most uh, privileged people on this planet. I have a PhD, I'm the president of a university, um, I grew up with a loving family. Uh, I am incredibly fortunate. And so all of these events, uh, I take them in very differently than Dr. Kelly does or than uh, Dr. Teo Bunton does or than Mike does uh, or than many of you do that are joining us today. Um, I'm gonna turn to my teacher mode very quickly because I really wanna listen to others today. Um, but uh, they're gonna put up on a screen four books. Um, I'm announcing uh, today that I am gonna do a President's Book Club this summer. Uh, you'll receive the dates, one late June, one late July. Uh, but we're gonna be talking uh, about a classic um, book by uh, James Baldwin, Fire Next Time, which I think I read for the first time in my uh, early 20s. Um, read again a few years back. Uh, and it is a really great book. Um, and then the second, a more recent book, um, Between the World and We, Me by ta Coates, another really excellent text. And I, you know, I, I put those out there mostly for people that are more like me because it was partly my attempt to try to understand. Uh, I love writing and education because it helps us to understand other people's lives. And so it allows me to try uh, in a imperfect way to understand uh, the lives that have been lived by my black neighbors um, and the ways in which society has harmed them. I'm gonna close my comments really quickly um, by stating a couple things. We got an email in the last few days from a group of our alumni and it asked us to be clear as a university on where we stand. So I'm gonna use their words to uh, somewhat close up my comments. So um, they wanted us to be clear on where we stand as a university and what they said in their closing comments was, we wanna know that Lewis University, and I'm stating this, Lewis University stands in solidarity with our black brothers and sisters and demand justice for crimes that are continually committed against black Americans. That is something we believe. And I, I wanna add a second statement, um, something that Pope Francis said in his uh, letter about uh, George Floyd's murder yesterday, in which he said that we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form, and at the same time claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. As a Catholic and LaSallean school, we believe in the dignity of every person. And I agree with the Pope when he says that we cannot turn a blind eye to the systemic racism that exists in our country and at the same time believe in the gospel. 
And so we will stand um, with all of the black lives across this country um, who are standing up and, and voicing their concerns. So uh, Dr. Kelly Wan, thank you so much for being with us today. Of course. Uh, Christy is our Chief Diversity Officer on campus, uh, but I'd like, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about what that role means, but I'd like you to, if you wanna share a little bit about how the last couple weeks, uh, maybe your entire life uh, has uh, been impacted, but especially what's happened lately. Absolutely. So I'll first start off by saying thank you for your transparency and, and recognizing your positionality in, in our country. Um, and I thank you for asking how this has impacted me personally. So when I think about uh, not only George's killing, uh, but the countless others, Dave, um, I have a, a variety of emotions. Um, I have been numb. I have been sad, I have been angry, but not in the sense of angry black woman, but angry. Um, and then I'll say fearful. And I'm fearful for um, the black race in particular, um, fearful for the men in my family, particularly my husband, my son, my father, and, and so on. And not only the men, but women too, afraid for myself and afraid for my daughter. Um, yet I'm hopeful, yet I'm hopeful. So that, that, that's how I've been affected over these mm -hmm. past several days. And today is a little bit better. Today is a little bit better. Well, and, and hopefully, you know, I, I, I must say that I'm, I'm proud of our country for, you know, voicing their outrage and, uh, and I, I know that, I think it's today, it might be tomorrow, that there's gonna be six days of kind of different celebrations of George's life, uh, culminating in his return to his, his home soil um, where uh, his burial will, will occur. But I do hope there's a, a, a healing process that happens for you, um, for your family, uh, you know, the outrage that I think we all feel um, hopefully it can turn into a transformation uh, of our society. So, uh, you know, one of the things that has happened in the last couple years is you've joined the leadership team here at Lewis University. Um, we created a position of a chief diversity officer. You also work in multicultural student services. But um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what is a chief diversity officer? Not everybody on this, you know, uh, call knows what that is. Sure. Um, you know, what you do for the university and, um, and some of the plans that you have uh, moving forward. Sure, so I know we have little time. <laughs> <laughs> so as I, as I think about what a Chief Diversity Officer um, is at, at Lewis, um, first, I must acknowledge, depending on the institution, you know, the Chief Diversity Officer may show up a little differently. Um, but here at Lewis, um, I often share with people that it is my, my job um, not solely, but my job to unite people and to connect people and to ensure that those that are affiliated with our campus feel like they belong here and feel like they are welcome. And a large part of my work um, leans on our sanctified zone. Um, I am hopeful that um, our campus community at large knows what that is, but in, in some, um, the sanctified zone has been around for a long time, uh, well over, not well over 20, 20 years, but just over 20 years, um, and was founded um, based on the strength of embracing diversity, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. So uh, fast forward though, 2020, the sanctified zone is still very much alive. Um, it has been built upon. Um, it is, it is uh, a statement, a bold statement that we've made, um, that we've identified declarations um, for intolerance of isms, if you will. And um, I, I, of course, I won't read our full statement and things of that nature, but I will call attention to uh, racism and, and institutional systemic racism is one of the declarations that we've made that are intolerable on our campus. Um, and, and in terms of what else I do in, as, as the chief diversity officer, it's looking at our institutional structures um, everywhere from 
uh, access and retention of historically underrepresented populations, um, looking at our body of employees and, and making sure that both of those populations have a, uh, feel like they have a culture of care on campus. So we, we Verdi had a question that, um, that, that came in and, um, and I guess I would just wanna pinpoint one of the things that you're talking about, which is, uh, and this isn't exactly what they asked, but it, it's in this, this light. So um, could you talk a little bit about how in your role you work with our human resource function to try to align our faculty and staff with the students that we serve? Absolutely. Um, human resources and I um, have partnered very intentionally over the past year and a half, little more than a year and a half, on representation. So we meet with uh, search committee charge, charge uh, members at the charge, uh, charge meetings, I'm sorry, um, to talk about uh, not fit, um, but uh, debunking unconscious bias and things of that nature. So um, we have been intentional about offering opportunities to have dialogue about um, fit and, and representation and, and making sure that our students uh, are mirrored in our faculty representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm so, I mean, I, I want to say this out loud. I'm so grateful for your presence on the leadership team and the work that you've done. You've also, you know, in addition to kind of restating on a yearly basis our commitment to our sanctified zone and working with HR, you've developed a, a plan for how we might move forward. As I said at the beginning, and I, I know you and I have talked about this before, the, um, we are on a journey in terms of our commitment towards being a sanctified zone. We're on a journey of uh, living into our Catholic and LaSallean values. We're, we're not perfect, mm -hmm. right? We're, as human beings, we're not perfect. And then as organizations, we carry all our imperfections into our organizations. Mm -hmm. But we strive mm -hmm. to be better. So could you, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's one or two things in the plan that you're hopeful about in the next year that you wanna really try to push forward um, during the 2020-21 school year? Absolutely, so in, in, in tandem with human resources and I would even say college deans, especially as it relates to faculty representation in the various disciplines, um, I look forward to working with those, those two groups, HR and college deans, in order to move that forward. The, the plan that you've referenced, Dave, is the Diversity, Equity, Equity and Inclusion Plan that was published this spring. Um, it is a document uh, that is, is never final. It is made available on our website, on our Diversity and Inclusion web, web page. Um, and it is one that is, is fairly robust, again, it's a journey, uh, but that is one of the dimensions in which mm -hmm. I look forward to focusing on over the next over the next year or so. That's great. So at this point, I think I'd like to um, bring in uh, our chief of police, uh, Mike Zagadlo. And um, uh, Mike, as you come in to join us, um, I, I was wondering if uh, if you could also um, talk a little bit about how this. Um, and it, I don't see my, there he is, there he is. He's on the screen, he's right behind us. I was like, I, I know he's there I'm somewhere, Mike. I know he can hear us. But um, Mike, could you talk a little bit about, you know, how this has impacted you as a police officer? I mean, you've been um, in this kind of, you know, not chief uh, here for that long, but you've been an officer, a sworn officer for a long time, and you, you posted, uh, I, I thought, a really great post uh, to your social media account um, several days back. But maybe you just talk a little bit about your own personal reaction to this. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to be, be able to talk about this. And you know, it, when I first watched the George Floyd video, I, I had an emotional reaction to it, which may not sound strange, but. I'm a police use of force instructor, so I've watched lots of these videos, and I tend to I tend to uh, be an analytical observer of these types of videos. I'm constantly looking at is this a video that's going to be relevant to training my police officers? I'm I'm kind of running my checklist on is this is this conduct constitutional? Is it reasonable? Does it comport with state statute? And and as the video kind of ticked on, 
my cognitive analysis of it gave way to just uh, a, a very powerful emotional response. And it, it, it was a combination of anger and sadness. And I was, I felt helpless. I wanted to jump into the screen and, and do something about what I was watching. And, you know, as, as each kind of moment in that video ticked on, and I, I realized each passing moment was an opportunity for that unfolding incident to be course corrected. And each passing moment was a missed opportunity to stop what was what was happening. So I, I've talked to lots of police leaders and, and, and other police officers, and, and I've not, the most common term I used was already used by you this morning, and that's outrage when people see this. So it, it, it's really been consistent in evoking this kind of visceral reaction from the police community to what we witnessed in that video. It's great. And, you know, I'm, I, I really am. One, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank you for keeping uh, our community, um, you know, safe and, and also for being a leader uh, as you talk about uh, training other officers. So one of the things that maybe you could talk a little bit about, how, how do leaders, I mean, you're in a leadership role, not only here, but you do uh, training uh, in the region. How, how do police leaders influence police culture? How, how, does, how does somebody like you create a culture on our campus in which um, we know that institutional racism exists and we refuse to be a part of it and we will fight it at every place that we find it? I mean, how do you, how do you change a police culture or, or modify a police culture when you see this kind of stuff? You know, I see police culture as it's an output product. Police conduct is an output product of, of all kinds of input variables. And a police leader has the ability to control some of those variables. And, you know, something simple like policy. You know, if, if your use of force policy was written in the late 70s and has been sitting on a shelf since then and you haven't looked, taken it out and reviewed it, that's a failure in leadership. You know, your use of force policy should contain an acknowledgement of the value of human life and human dignity. It should have a section on chokeholds. It should contain an element of uh, an, a duty to intervene when a peer officer is conducting himself in a way that's unconstitutional or unlawful or unreasonable. And that's the kind of modern progressive policy that sets the, the basic minimum standard for the conduct of our police officers. Another really important aspect, and, and Christy addressed this earlier, is selection. Uh, how do we choose our police officers? And what does your, and that's something that a police chief has control over. How does your selection process look for officers that will diversify your police department and make your police department more reflective of your community, but will also emulate and, and be able to function in the type of values that, that your community has? What kind of questions are you asking to challenge candidates about issues like bias and diversity? And are you accepting you know, contrite canned answers like I don't see color and I treat everyone equally? Or are you looking for your candidates to, uh, to give you a little bit deeper analysis and to demonstrate some sort of evidence that they have some cultural competency? It doesn't have to be perfect, but we want them to have thought about these things at some point. So, Mike and, and Christy, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in. But you, you mentioned a bias and, and, and Christy earlier mentioned bias in terms of even um, trying to get our managers as they hire to try to be able to be aware of their unconscious bias. So um, maybe either or both of you could speak to this question of how do we, how do we try to address or mitigate or respond to um, both our own unconscious bias, you know, I, I tried to state at the beginning, you know, I'm a, I'm a white man of privilege and that creates certain biases in me and I try to fight them all the time but both of you work in this area, you try to help people to see things and understand things that they can't see themselves because we have all these, you know, um, planks in our eyes as, a, as the gospel might say. Um, so Mike, maybe you can start with that or Christy, you can jump in when you want. I mean, give me a sense of what you do on that front of, of bias, especially those biases that we're less aware of. Well, when I talk with go police, ahead, and police leaders on the on the topic of bias, I think they, they there's a there's a hill that we have to get over as it relates to bias, and and I think 
police pride themselves on character. And when, when I talk with police officers and, and say things like, we all have bias, that's part of the human condition, it's part of our hardwiring, it's built into the operating system. I think police see that as an attack on character. And if I admit that I have bias, I am, I'm in some way morally flawed or there's something wrong with my character. So we, we need to kind of switch the perception and recognize bias as a simple function of being a human being and that it's, 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 it's hardwired into the software. So once we get over that hump and we're no longer attacking your character because you have bias, we can start to say, okay, how do we begin to recognize that bias when it's, uh, when it's occurring and what are our remedies for mitigation so that it doesn't interfere, interfere with our decision-making, our assessment of reasonable suspicion or probable cause. And, and that, that gets built in through the whole training process. So it, it begins in the police academy with this kind of recognition that it's there and it's present and it's at work. And we have to begin to train out. And when we get into field training and you know, we're driving down the street with our FTO and we're trying to figure out who we're gonna stop and talk to, the FTO needs to be able to challenge that new recruit and, and have him do the math on what's suspicious about that subject and is bias playing a role in whether or not we're gonna go stop and talk to him. And if it is, we work on training that out. So it's, it, it, but it begins with that acknowledgement that it's just there and it's present and it's not, it doesn't make you a bad person. It's just baked into the cake. Yeah, and Chrissy, you were gonna say something. Mike, you hit it, you hit it spot on. Um, I, I, I was actually gonna say the, the first step, right, is recognizing that we all have, we have biases. Um, and, 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 and once we can start there um, in this awareness phase, um, then we can trudge along more positively. Yes. Um, so thank you, Mike, for those comments. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I wanna say thank you too. And we're, we're gonna switch to uh, Dr. Tayo Bunton in a second, Mike, but a last little comment. I mean, I guess, I think it's important, you know, what I've realized this week is, just going back to biases, the other thing that can be very dangerous is assumptions. You know, um, no, you know, I realized with many emails that I got over the last two weeks, a week and a half, um, that I can't assume that people know that Lewis University stands against institutional racism, that we have to say it out loud. Uh, because if we don't say it out loud, then people assume that, well, if you haven't said anything. So could you just kind of, in some sense, say out loud, um, you know, the, the acts, the murder, um, um, accusation of murder against George Floyd, um, that this is, it, I mean, you've said this in many ways, but I guess I'd like to, you know, have you say it for our audience, that it just has no place in policing. It has no place in policing. I mean, it, it, it was egregious. And, you know, I don't, I, I can't put myself inside that officer's head, so I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But what I saw was egregious, it was unreasonable, it was unconstitutional, and it was unlawful. And, 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 and I don't know any other police officer that I've interacted with that has a different analysis on what took place in the eight minutes of that video. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I mean, and I, you know, I, I only put you on the spot because kind of I've been put on the spot this week and I realize that it's just so helpful for people when people are just as clear as possible. And you said it earlier, but I guess it just helps to say it again. So uh, we're gonna switch and, and, and you know, um, Chief Sagadlo may be back with us, um, depending on the questions or, you know, we might call him back in as, as we uh, continue this conversation. But I'd like to invite into the conversation um, Dr. Jennifer Teo Bunton, who's an assistant professor of sociology here at Lewis. Um, and I won't go through her whole CV, but she has really focused on issues of institutional racism, intersectionality, issues uh, around the Latinx population and, and, and some of the ways in which they have been marginalized. Um, but I, I guess I'll start with the same way I've started with everybody else. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what you've experienced personally over the last 10 days in terms of your reaction to this incident? And then maybe we can get more into kind of the sociology. Um, and some of the more, uh, you know, conceptual things that underlie some of this? Sure, absolutely. Um, just like uh, Christy and Mike have pointed out, like the last few days have been full of 
lots of different emotions, anger, sadness, grief, frustration, um, but also a sense of inevitability, I think, that this, while a lot of people are, are taken by surprise by the outbursts of anger and frustration, um, if you were watching all along, <laughs> you could see that it was building up, right? That these things have been happening. These, these instances in the last few weeks are not the first, they are the last, oh, well, they are the current, not probably the last, in a long, long line of, of mistreatment and murder and killing of black people at the hands of law enforcement because of the lack of training and the implicit biases and all the different things that, um, that Mike spoke about. So, um, you know, as somebody who studies this, it's been really hard because <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, everyone's, I mean, the positive part of it is that people are listening more than they were before. Um, and so it is getting more of a discussion. The, the very fact that we're having a, a conversation in front of the whole Lewis community and beyond about institutional racism is a huge change from what previous years, um, the, what, who wanted to hear about that, who wanted to hear that story, so. Yeah, so um, uh, Jennifer, could you, I mean, so you, you've mentioned this a couple times and we've mentioned it as we've gone through this, but. Could you talk a little bit, help, help us understand, uh, the audience understand, help me understand better, what systems of oppression and systemic racism, what, is that, what does that mean? What do we mean by that when we use those terms? Because I, I don't, that's not in everybody's daily vocabulary. It's becoming more, as you say, because of this incident. But um, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Before I get to actually defining the term, I wanted to share a little bit about my own relationship to this term and how I came to study it. Um, and it goes back to something that happened to me when I was six years old. I was reading a book and I learned a new word. The word was mutt. And I didn't know this word, so I asked my dad what it meant. And he was very upset and asked me if someone had called me that. And I said, no, I just read it in a book. And then he explained to me that it meant a mixed breed dog. I left that conversation wondering why he was so concerned that someone would call me this. I was only six. So I didn't understand at the time that being the daughter of a Mexican American father and a white woman um, made me vulnerable <laughs> to being um, slurred in that way of being compared to a dog. Uh, uh, a mixed breed dog, right, as an animal. Um, I didn't learn that personally until a lot later, but my dad knew, obviously, he had been fighting that fight his whole life um, to be seen as a whole person, to be valued in a society that only saw his skin color and punished him physically in school for speaking the language of our culture and our family. And that is really a big reason why I was drawn to sociology, to be able to understand those experiences and to be under, understand how all of our experiences are kind of situated in these bigger systems of oppression um, that are embedded into our society and also to try to figure out how to dismantle those systems. <laughs> so that's really what drew me. So drew me to the topic, um, institutional racism, um, what we're seeing today is a consequence of generations of institutional racism in our country. For people of color, it's not new. Um, the videos of the deaths of George Floyd, of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and then the most recent one of David McAtee in Louisville, they are just highlighting the truth that's been passed down for generations of black families in the United States. So in, social, in the social sciences, we have a concept <laughs> to explain this. Um, and um, that concept is uh, institutional racism. And I have a slide, I don't know if they want to, if that's available <laughs> yeah. to uh, provide the definition for that. Um, but it's a systemic oppression of people of color that is embedded and operating in all of the institutions that make up our society corporations, universities, legal systems, political bodies, cultural life, other collectives. The United States was founded upon this this oppression through slavery. And even now after generations, we haven't escaped it yet, right? So the tricky thing about institutional racism today is that it 
it's very, it's harder to see, right? We don't have Jim Crow laws, <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that everything has uh, been fixed and we are a racially blind society, right? Um, it doesn't have to be, institutional racism doesn't have to be intentional. You can, we all participated in a variety of different ways, whether or not we personally are racist or have racist thoughts, right? It's embedded into the fabric of our society so that whites benefit from it, even if they themselves are not intentionally racist. And it's often uh, invisible to those who are not experiencing it, right? And this, I think, comes into what you were talking about with the unconscious bias, right? That we've been swimming in a culture that pushes these, these ideas, these stereotypes onto all of us so that we've been socialized into those ideas so intensely that we aren't even aware that we're practicing them in many ways. Yeah, so, so and I, I'd love to hear maybe both Christy and Jennifer say maybe a little something about this, because you're raising a really important uh, issue, I think, Jennifer. I, you know, one of, I've been reading a lot about um, just, you know, other people in society's comments, and what you just mentioned um, reminded me of the uh, op-ed piece that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote in which he talked about dust, where you don't see these dust particles in the air until you like open up the you know the curtains and the light shines in. All of a sudden, you see these little speckles, but it's been around you all the time, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are people in our society who say, "But it's so much better now," <laughs> right? I mean, uh, Dr. Taylor Tayo Bunton talked about we don't have the Jim Crow laws anymore. Um, We've had an African-American president. Certainly, things are fine, right? So could both of you just speak to that a little bit about this whole notion of all the laws that have been put into place, certainly there's not institutional racism anymore because we have all these laws and if a president can be elected and instead we have individuals who are prejudiced and just act on their own. So I, I, I guess I'd like to hear both of you talk a little bit more about that because one thing is uh, what Jennifer just said earlier in her list on that definition was the word university, right? And so we as a university have this inside of us, which is why you are a part of the team as a chief diversity officer. So it um, doesn't really matter <laughs> which one of you starts. And I have been rambling a little bit, but I guess my question is, what is the response to those in the Lewis community who say, you know, it, we've, we've come so far, why do you still keep bringing this up? Well, and, and, and Jen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that you're the expert, but my initial response is, is this notion of, of diversity. You know, we can claim diversity, right? We have come a long way, but it's not because um, there's been an intentional effort in terms of diversity. Inevitably, uh, populations are growing, uh, particularly the Latinx population is one of the fastest growing populations. And so it's not enough to say, oh, we're diverse, we're, we're a diverse population and this is wonderful, right? For me, it's the inclusivity part that's important. And there's multiple iterations on what inclusion and in inclusiveness means. Um, but it, it's, it's the access to higher education and are we retaining students? Now I'm talking university, right? So um, th that's my initial reaction. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, I mean, your thoughts on that? Sure, absolutely. So um, the civil rights uh, um, activism of the 1960s, they gave us so many amazing laws, right? The Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, the Civil Rights Act, all kinds of anti-discrimination laws. Um, and, uh, and on the face of it, it seems, all right, check that box. We've taken care of that, right? But the reality is that, uh, and before I even get to that, I want to say, I want to emphasize that we weren't, that those activists were not just given those laws, right? They fought and died for those laws blood, sweat, and tears, and I mean literally, to get those laws into place so that we could continue the fight today. Um, and we should be immensely grateful for the work of those women and men who gave us those legal protections. 
but racism in our country was over 400 years in the making, and we're only 50 years past the civil rights movement, six, that, that civil rights movement. It can't be dismantled overnight, right? Our country itself was founded on the principles of equality, but it was also founded on slavery and the theft of land from Native Americans. Racism was developed in our nation as a way to justify this contradiction. All men are created equal. Then how can we justify slavery? How can we justify the taking of land from the indigenous peoples? By taking them out of the equation, right? By saying that people with brown or black skin don't count, that we aren't real people. Those ideas are embedded deeply into our society like a cancer, and we haven't done the work to dig it out. So one way to think about this is to is a distinction that we make in uh, sociology about de jure racism versus de facto racism. So de jure means by law. And that means that we've got those laws on the book. So de jure, um, the books say these things are illegal, right? De facto means in practice. We've not done the work to take those laws and put them into practice in a significant way in our society. We need to create an anti-racist and just society in practice, right? So you can think of it like the speeding limit on the highway. You put the sign up there that says 65 miles an hour, but that doesn't mean any, uh, any or even most of the drivers are going to drive 65 miles an hour on that highway. We all know that, right? <laughs> um, it's better than having no speed limit, but it's definitely not completing, completely getting rid of the, of the problem of speeding on the highway. And that's where we are today is that we've, we've put into place these laws, but we're not following, executing them, uh, you know, demanding that they be followed in a way that has created meaningful change to the degree that I think we all would like to see in society. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I, I'm gonna shift a little bit just because we've had a question that has come in from the audience and I wanna bring, uh, Mike Zagadlo back into the conversation because uh, the, the question, and, and I'll just uh, read it and try to reposition it for you, Mike. Um, I, I, well, I'll let you try to answer it. Uh, the question is, how can we be sure that a Lewis police officer will not use excessive force or behave with bias to a minority on our campus? So, um, Mike, I, I think you heard that. We can't see you right now. Uh, we're still seeing Jennifer, but um, either you know, um, speaking it, or, or we'll get your, uh, you know, your face back with us. Um, can you just respond to that? So, you know, and I guess what I, the way I'd restate it is, and I, I want to go to what Jennifer just said. They know that the president just said, and the chief of police just said. The law is that we treat everybody with dignity and we treat everybody equally. They wanna know about the de facto question of when I come back to campus this fall, how do you assure me mm -hmm. that I'm gonna be safe on this campus as a black student? So Mike, I don't, I don't know if you can uh, you know, talk a little bit to that. I, I get a similar question frequently from parents uh, at orientation you know a mom and dad will come up and say how do you can you guarantee me that my daughter is going to be safe when they come to your campus I, I there's no way to make a promise like that we can however take a lot of steps to ensure that our officers are properly trained that our uh, officers understand our own values and our community's values that we can uh, many of the things i mentioned in my previous comments with selection training policy all comport with that. We do a lot of training for a small department and a lot of that training uh, surrounds use of force. And I believe that we do very progressive training in terms of um, live action scenario training and we integrate aspects of, uh, of decision making and bias into everything from our open hand control tactics to firearms training. Um, we do real time scenario based training where officers are challenged to make quick decisions in under high stress situations as it relates to use of force. So those are all considered best practices and I'm very confident that we're doing well in that area, but it's impossible to make any guarantee to predict human behavior. 
Yeah. No, I think that's great. My, I think that's, you know, it's probably, again, I think it's the best we can do is that we keep working at it. Um, an absolute, it will never happen, would go against really what Dr. Taylor Bunton said, what, you know, Dr. Kelly said, what you're saying. Um, we're, you know, we, we usually try to wrap this up in about 45 minutes. We've got about five minutes left, and we have a, a whole host of questions that are coming in. Okay. So I'm going to try to address some of these questions um, that, that are here. And, and I'll address the first one because I'm probably the, the only one on this call that can. So we had an alumni that had a question about our investment strategy and whether our values are lived out, especially values around race um, in terms of how our endowment um, we do use some, um, some social justice screenings uh, in our portfolio management. Um, it, what I would say is it's, it's also not perfect, and it is a, we're on a journey in terms of that. Um, but we do have some uh, social screenings uh, that, that keep us from investing in certain companies that go against our values. And I could certainly have a longer conversation if that person wants to contact uh, my office, and we could talk a little bit more about that. We have a couple staff questions, and Christy, I think you might be the best person to talk about this, though Though certainly um, Mike and Jennifer, you know, from their own just experience with their colleagues might be able to address this, but the, the staff questions are around um, whether we believe, I, I, I mean, asking, I guess, all of us, that, um, that we lose more um, faculty and staff of color um, because of the way that our institution still is racist, mm -hmm. right? And w we've already admitted that we're on a journey and all institutions, um, institutional racism exists in universities and it certainly exists at Lewis. Not that we, we don't want that, but it is a, it's a part of the fabric and we're always trying to make it better. So Christy, do you know in kind of the work you've done uh, either with Chella or with others uh, when we do exit interviews, do, do you believe that, um, that we're losing you know, more African-American and uh, Latinx faculty and staff um, because of this? And are there any things in your plan that are gonna try to address those kinds of things? Excellent question. Um, I, I would say, um, that is not the exclusive reason on which faculty and staff of color depart from the university. Um, oftentimes it's because there are other opportunities in, in, their, in their career trajectory. Um, but the, the um, feedback that Chella and I have gotten, um, we have a, attempted to address, again, journey. Um, and, and so oftentimes we are meeting with departments if there are, there are things that we are made aware of um, that have transpired. So full, full transparency, we have one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with the managers of those areas to address what we hear about usually after the departure has been made. So, and maybe I'll say, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know if, um, if Jennifer or Mike, I don't know if you wanna, you know, you're more, you know, is there water cooler conversation where you feel that, um, you know, you're really concerned about something, you know, in some sense you can share it with me and, and with Christy, I mean, our job together is to try to create a sanctified zone so people wanna work here. Um, but maybe, I don't know if you have any reaction to that question from a staff member. Well, I'll uh, just say that, um, uh, like I mentioned with my definition, as you pointed out, universities were in that list of places that are dealing with institutional racism, right? And I think that the creation of Christie's position here in the last few years and the work that the Diversity Engagement Committee is doing, the work that they're doing in HR, is really trying to address those issues. Um, being a faculty member of color is challenging because there is a lot of this work that um, that our white colleagues aren't called upon to do or have an interest in doing. And so we often get overwhelmed by um, the, the needs of our students and the needs of our, of our colleagues and the needs of the institution in order to be able to answer these questions. And it can be really easy to burn out um, and to just not feel like you have anything um, 
anything left to give. And I think that is, um, that's not just Lewis, that's faculty across the country of color who are um, dealing with this. And I think that as we are creating the spaces where we can express those concerns and express the kinds of um, interactions that we may have with colleagues who are una uh, oftentimes unaware of the, um, the impact that their words may be having on us, um, the more that we have spaces where we can talk about that and um, feel like that we're heard from the, from the administration, the more we're going to move towards that. And that is, as Christy said, is a journey that we're really working hard to create that space. But it's, um, you know, it's challenging for all universities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Jennifer. Mike, do you have, I don't know if you have any, I mean, you don't have to have anything. It's not, you know, kind of a question that uh, you were prepared to address, but it's really more just as an employee. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I can't think uh, anecdotally of an employee that, that we've lost or that's come through our department that's, that's encountered that. But, you know, I'm also a white male, so I, <laughs> there's, there's probably a lot going on that I'm maybe not savvy to or, or not, uh, not picking up on. So, yeah, well, thank you. And um, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and what I'll add, as opposed to leaving because we're a racist campus, I think the fear that there's not even enough of us, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. not seeing a peer, you know what I mean, that yes. looks like you or um, that you can connect with may sometimes is 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 not attractive to sure. to candidates because there's that fear of I'm the token black person or if if I uh, make a comment and have to identify myself then they know it's me because there's so little yes. folks of color. So and I and I just want to reemphasize the work that you're doing with um, and we keep referring to child. So those those of you that are you know You're students or parents or <laughs> Chella DeFore is our um, uh, associate VP of human resources and she's a really important part of this equation uh, you know you can only have so many guests but she would be another person that would be important to talk to in this and certainly we want you to feel free to contact Dr. Kelly or contact uh, Chella uh, for those of you that are our employees but I just want to reemphasize the work that you and Chella uh, and uh, Dr. Sent, who isn't with us today, um, but uh, I know is very involved in these, that we want to hire a diverse, we have 600 full-time employees. Mm -hmm. We want those 600 full-time employees to be a diverse expression of our society, of our world. And, and, uh, and Chella and Christy and Chris and others are working toward that in, in every hire that we do. Um, a, a couple other questions that have uh, that have come in, um, and I don't know. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know who should react to this because it might fall into all three of your areas. So, but it's a question about microaggression, and you know this is a topic that has been raised. Uh, you know, I would say it kind of seemed to come up about five years ago in terms of my reading. Um, I don't know if there's any reaction to that, uh, or if anybody, I don't know if, uh, you know, Dr. Teo Bunton wants to talk mm -hmm. about defining it. Um, and then, you know, certainly these kind of events uh, occur, but uh, I, I don't know. Jennifer, do you want to, if you're willing or able to say a little thing about microaggression and what people mean by that? Because maybe not everybody on the call it came in from, from uh, I think, a staff person, but um, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, so microaggressions refers to the little everyday things that um, the people of color and women um, and um, other minorities experience that can just sort of dig in at you like one little pinprick at a time every single day, a comment by a white colleague you know, uh, you know, I can give you an example of my my sister in law, my former sister in law, um, talking about how uh, her apartment building was uh, so much nicer now that the Mexicans had moved out. Saying that to me as a Mexican American woman, right? Um, things like that. People talking about um, your hair, or your appearance, or judging your um, 
your the way that you're interacting. You know, Christy talked about the um, being perceived as the angry black woman, right? Things like that. Um, being talked over in meetings or not heard or seeing that something that you said um, five minutes ago is being reset by a whiter male colleague and then they're being heard when they say it, right? Um, you know, the Obama administration, um, you know, a black president, right? The women in his administration um, experienced this as well. And there's a great story um, about how they fought these microaggressions within their meetings by reiterating what the last person, what the last woman had said that had been ignored, right? So my colleague makes a good point and that gets ignored. So I'm gonna say, just as Christy said, um, I would like to you know, reemphasize that. And so just that constant work that you have to do to overcome those, um, those microaggressions that oftentimes the people who are making them aren't even aware that they're, that they're doing that or that it's having that kind of impact. I appreciate that. We're, we're a little over time, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. Okay. It's been a really great conversation. We're really grateful to the people who have sent in uh, their comments or questions. So I, I usually, as I wrap up, so Mike, any last thing that you want to say uh, before we close? I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this and understand that the, I, I like the term journey, and this is, you know, this is a continued process, and we're all involved in it together and I, I really appreciate the fact that we have colleagues that that we can collaborate with like like all of you thank you very much and I, I really just want to say thank you so much for being here today we really appreciate it um, Jennifer do you have any last comments absolutely I would just encourage people to get involved get involved on campus get involved in your community um, if you need ideas of how to do that, come see me, come see other faculty members. I'm sure Christy would be willing to help as well. Um, but the most important thing that I would like to leave this, um, this conversation with is just to our black students at Lewis. And I want you to know that the pain that is going across our country is seen and is heard and your pain is heard here at Lewis. I, I stand in solidarity with you as a, fac as a Lewis faculty member, as a woman, and as a Latina. And I, I want you to hear me say Black Lives Matter and you matter. And I, and along with all of these other folks here, are going to continue to work every day to make Lewis a safe and nurturing community for you. My door is always open. Email me, call me. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want more ideas of where you can look for organizations or information or some of the research that's on this, definitely. Or if you just want to say hi, um, I'm here as a resource, not just for the students in my individual classrooms, but for all the students on campus. And um, that's just what I'd like to end with. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Teo Bunton. Uh, Jennifer, you've just been, it's been great to have you on. So thank you for not only the rich knowledge that you uh, have, uh, but for your passion for our mission and care for our students. So uh, Christy, any last comments? Very, very briefly, um, I, I just want to say that one, I love what I do. It's more than a job. Um, it's a way of life for me. Um, to my, um, my partners on campus, faculty and staff who have worked with me to um, move the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I love you, not in the romantical sense, but I really appreciate your passion. To the students, uh, all students, but particularly uh, black students and, and students who have different positionalities and identities, um, I will continue to support you. Um, we are working very, very hard behind the scenes and we're doing things right and, and sometimes, oops, not exactly right. Um, but I am here for you as is uh, many of my colleagues across campus. And I just really wanna reference resources, uh, Dave, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, we have some resource slides. So, you know, we, we, again, we're a little over time, but a couple of things that, you know, just valuable. And the other thing about this uh, that I wanna restate and then I'll let Christy go back to these resources is, these are available afterwards, so if you want to send this link to a friend because you feel like they would benefit from it, or if you want to see the slides that we put up today, those are also available um, for people. So uh, yeah, the reference slides, um, uh, John, if you could put those up so Christy could walk through them very quickly.
Resources on campus, is that the one yes, you wanted? Yes, resources, uh-huh. Yeah. We'll get that slide up in a second. There we are. Some, some may be new in terms of what's listed um, to, to some folks or some may be um, old, but I just want to reiterate that on this campus, these things are available to both students and, and employees. Um, and, and really quickly, I wanna call attention to um, our, our uh, employee assistance program as well as health and counseling as um, there are resources, particularly for students of color, um, that, that can be accessed. And, and, and please get beyond the, the cliche of it's health and counseling. So um, that, those are all, those are my closing remarks. And, and I thank you, Dave, for allowing this platform. Yeah, well, thank you everyone um, for joining us this afternoon. I, I wanna echo a few things that were said in the closing comments. I do wanna say to our students and our employees, certainly to our alumni as well, uh, that uh, black lives do matter. Uh, they matter to us at Lewis. Um, I, you know, I think what has hit me the hardest in the last couple weeks is being a dad. Um, I've talked to a couple colleagues, um, African-American colleagues uh, of mine who have talked about their children and, and having these conversations with their children. And I, I guess I just wanna say that, you know, what, what's most painful in the reading I do and in the conversations I have is that uh, a parent has to look into the face of the child that they love and know that they're not safe in our society if they're a black, child who gets into their car and, and drives out to just enjoy an evening. And that is um, painful beyond words. Um, we are a community of faith. And so I, I would like to wrap up with uh, just a, a brief prayer. Um, you know, we, we always at Lewis University um, begin our prayers um, in that we remember that we are in God's holy presence and um, this God of love and justice is with us. And we ask God to be with uh, all of the people that have suffered and especially with the family and friends of George Floyd and all the other people who have lost their lives uh, due to this systemic racism that we've uh, spent the last hour talking about. So um, many blessings to all of you and uh, we wish you well, and we are grateful for you. Uh, stay safe, and uh, come back and join us next week.